privilege and a blessing to be together. What a wonderful weekend we have had here at West Hill. We've invited these young men to come in to learn principles of leadership. Corey has put together a great program with some tremendous talent, men of the book, men of a a spiritual presence that are tremendous examples and encourager, and we had a wonderful weekend. I know that several of the adults uh, were, were cooking and cleaning and getting to hear some of the lessons, and some of the elders were there at different times, and uh, uh, first of all, I want to say to Corey, thank you. Uh, wonderful job, brother. And to the elders, thank you for your vision and your foresight. This, this is a foretaste of glory divine. And to the young men for giving up your weekend, Actually, let me take that back. You didn't give up your weekend. You enhanced your weekend by fellowship with one another and drawing closer to God. And that will always be a blessing to you. They say that when babies are young, that they engage with the eyes. Little children, babes, as they're just a few weeks old and their eyes are beholding the world, they are captivated by the eyes of their mother as they look down upon them. As they get a little older and they have some fine motor skills and we play the little game peekaboo. You know the game, you, you cover over the eyes. They say it's one of, one of the things that's amazing to children is, is when you cover over those eyes and they can't see the eyes that they think you're gone, that you've disappeared. That's why they're so surprised when you, you pull the eye, hands away And they're surprised, oh, daddy's back. And I remember playing some intense games of peekaboo with my boys when they were younger. So intense that I kept score and I won. And this is, I hate to kind of admit this because they always thought I was magic and actually disappeared, but I was there the whole time. I never left. We understand as we get a little older that There's more to us than just the eyes. And just because we cannot see it doesn't mean that it has disappeared. There's a lot of people that are living life playing peekaboo with hell. Because they can't see hell, hell must somehow not be real. One religious writer was talking about hell. And he says that one view of God, the more fundamentalist view is of a retributive God just itching to punish those who stray. The other equally ancient view goes right back into the New Testament era, is of an all-forgiving God who in the person of Jesus Christ ended the era of a scapegoat sacrifice, retribution, and punishment forever. God is a merciful Father who loves all His children equally, This is the less known view today because fundamentalists through televangelists and others have been so loud and dominant in North American culture. Do we really want to go back to a time of literalistic religion? Wasn't 9-11 enough of an argument against retributive religion? We need hell like we need a hole in the head. It's time for the alternative of empathetic, merciful religion to be understood. I guess we could spend an entire week on how many things are wrong with that statement. This false dichotomy that that if, if God is all loving and merciful, that therefore it is impossible for hell to exist. That's not a dichotomy at all. That is a God who is who is both merciful and just at the same time. A God who wants nothing more than to save us. God is not slack concerning His promise toward us, not wanting that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. But there is punishment. Because God is a just God. He is a holy God. And He cannot in His presence stand sin. How does a merciful God, who is also just, overcome these things? Well, He sends His Son, Jesus, as a sacrifice. He gives up His own Son so that we might have 
a home with him. But there's a lot of people who've bought into Schaefer's idea that hell no longer exists. His ideas, however, are far from Christianity. He says that it's because of televangelists and fundamentalists. I say it's because of the book. The book very clearly teaches us that there is eternal punishment and that we need to understand that. It's not an argument from 9-11. It's an argument from the day of Pentecost. It's an argument from the, from the day of the fall in the Garden of Eden. And what he is teaching is just wishful thinking at best. It's little more than unfounded hope and gobbledygook. Hell doesn't cease to exist simply because Tom, Dick, and Harry have decided that they don't believe in it anymore. And and it goes back and it's just like a child playing peekaboo. He's playing peekaboo with the devil. And the devil will win that one. Because as surely as we think the devil doesn't exist and hell is not real, we've already lost, not a game, but we've lost our souls. We look around and we say, well, that's, that's bad. We know that those are liberal progressive writers. Or we know that those who are not founded in biblical truths. And those are people who don't understand the Bible. But we, as Christians, we believe in hell. But I'm afraid that there's a lot of Christians who are in just as much denial of hell. Men and women who are otherwise very faithful act like hell is just a myth. You see, when when we are nonchalant about the masses who are resolutely marching toward hell, we act like hell's not real. When we when we are, are more interested in saving our friendships than we are about saving souls, then we act like hell is not real. We can say we believe in it all along, but until we do something about it, as long as we are silent about the spiritual dangers that lurk around us in our own lives, in our children's lives, in the lives of our friends and our co-workers, if we are silent in those moments, then we are acting like hell is not even real. And Jude invites us to put on our God glasses. See the world how God sees it. And he tells us that when we get our God glasses on, we will start seeing the fires that are burning even now all around us. People are standing in the flames. Their lives are in torment. And from here, it just gets worse in eternity. But at least here, we have an opportunity. As Jude says, we we are snatching them out of the fire. That's our goal. That's what God has challenged us to do is to to remove them from the danger of the fire that they stand in and the torment that is bringing their lives down. And what it tells us is the simple truth that hell is real. If you walk away this morning, understand this. Hell is real. When we talk about hell, we're talking about something Jesus spoke of often. Of all the biblical writers, Moses, all the psalmist, the apostle Paul, no Bible writer, no Bible speaker, no prophet spoke of hell, judgment, and punishment more than Jesus. It's kind of interesting because you think that in the world's idea of Jesus that he is so, uh, such a, a pushover and so mamby-pamby about things, surely Jesus wouldn't really talk about hell, would he? Why, that's unloving, that's unkind. We we need hell like a hole in the head. And yet Jesus spoke more about hell and punishment than anyone else in the Bible. If you were to take all the topics that Jesus spoke of, loving the brethren, the kingdom that was to come, the church which he's building, righteousness, sin, hell, You take all the topics that he spoke about, roughly 13% of what we have recorded from Jesus is about hell, about judgment and punishment. 
You say, well, 13% is not that much. Well, think about all the different things that he spoke about. That's one of the largest percentages of any topic was hell. Jesus was serious about us understanding the dangers of hell for ourselves and for all of those around us. Notice how the Bible describes hell in different ways. For example, in Matthew chapter 13, it's what we refer to as the the, uh, the parable of the weeds or the parable of the tares. And here is a man who has sown his field, the good crops, and then his enemy comes in and sows in the weeds. And as the crop comes up, he sees both the, the grain and the, and the weeds. And, and obviously there's some uh, 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 anger in his servants. Or, well, let's go pull them weeds up. And he says, no, no, we've got to wait to pull them up because if we try to pull them up now, we may pull up the grain. We'll disturb the good crop. But what we'll do is in the end, in the end, we'll, take, uh, we'll pull them all out and then we'll separate them, the weeds and, and, the, and the grain, and we will burn the weeds. Here Jesus says, as he begins to explain that parable in Matthew 13, beginning in verse 40, he said, Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age when the Son of Man will send forth his angels and they will gather out of, out of uh, his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and will throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Here Jesus describes hell as that fiery furnace. I think when we think of hell, flames and fire immediately burst into our mind. It's a connection that we have, we have been making since we were little children. Phrases like burn in hell are indelibly linked to hell in our minds and our hearts. We understand the idea of fire, but hell is also referred to in the Bible as darkness. Think about it in the parable of the wedding feast when they are told to go out and bring in Whoever will come, when the first invitees wouldn't, or invitees wouldn't come, and so uh, whoever will come, and he comes, and then the king walks over, and there's one man there. He doesn't know him. He's one of those that is a, 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 a scab that others wouldn't come, and, but he shows up, and he's not wearing his wedding garment. He's not prepared to stand before the king. And the king says, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness in that place. There will be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Out of the kingdom there are those who are, have come to the wedding feast and are, are standing at the hors d'oeuvre table, but they're not dressed properly. They have not put on Christ in baptism because He is the wedding cloak that we need to be seen in. And in that day, on that judgment day, they will be taken up and bound hand and foot and cast not just into the fiery furnace, but he says, cast into the outer darkness. I don't like coming home and the house being completely dark. If I leave and I know I'm going to come back after dark, I want, I want some light on just to show me where I'm going so that I don't trip over the ottoman or something. Imagine an eternity of darkness to not be able to see and identify your own hand in front of your face. To hear in the distance the weeping and the wailing, to hear the groanings, but not to be able to see where they come from. The Bible describes hell as darkness. The Bible describes hell as punishment, as Jesus has divided those on his right hand and his left hand, and he says to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, and inherit the kingdom which was prepared for you. And he says to those on the right hand, Depart, get away from me. And at the end of that discussion, he says, These will go away into everlasting punishment, but these unto everlasting life. There is punishment in hell. We understand the concept of punishment, discipline that comes because of rule breaking, because we have not lived the way God has called us to live, because we have not followed His commandments. Because we have sinned, punishment comes. And it's not undeserved punishment. This is punishment every moment of which we deserve. Because we have we've offended the God who sent His Son 
for us. Isn't it true that when you've done something for someone else, if you've given them resources that you could have used yourself, when you give them the skin off your back, as it were, and they ignore that, or they stomp on that, they disregard that, Years ago, someone came to me, a good friend. He said, I don't have enough money to pay my bills. I said, well, I've, I've got a little extra money. How much you need? And he, you need quite a bit of money. It's like $600. This is 20 years ago, $600. This is me 20 years ago, $600. And I gave it to him. And a month later, he went skiing in Colorado on a ski vacation. I... I didn't even get to go on a ski vacation. And you can imagine how I felt. How dare you? I, I gave you that money to pay your bills. I did. I paid my bills with that. But the money I was going to pay my bills with, I used that for skiing. You just want to punish them. God says, look, I've, I've given you my son I've sacrificed him for you so that you, you may come away from your sin so that you, you don't have to be lost. And a lot of people turn and spit on that sacrifice. And those that do, he says, they will go away into everlasting punishment. It doesn't stop with punishment. The Bible describes hell as banishment. When Jesus said that the angels are coming and in flaming fire taking vengeance on those that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, he said these will go away or they will suffer punishment to eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his might, 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 9. Away from the presence of God. Hell is where God is not. The Bible describes hell as a restlessness. To those worshipers of the beast and its image, those who received his mark in Revelation 14 and verse 11, he says that the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they shall have no rest day or night. They can't sit there and say, well, this is only going to happen for two years, and then at the end of two years, I'm set free. This is only a 40 year sentence. This is only a 4,000 year sentence. This, we're talking about no rest, day or night, forever. Hell is a restlessness. Hell is the second death. As we see those who were cowardly and those who were faithless, detestable murderers, the sexually immoral sorcerers, idolaters, and liars, all of these will have their portion in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is, he says, the second death. There is a death that we have in the physical body. But we know after that there will be a resurrection. This is the second death. The separation from God. And agony. We've seen it in several of the passages we've already looked at. But we'll go to another one that we haven't looked at yet. Matthew 25 and verse 30. At the end of the parable of the talents... Cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and the gnashing of teeth. The weeping and the groaning, the, the biting on their tongue, the gritting of the teeth because this is agony. Hell is real. The Bible so clearly tells us. And what that means, if hell is real, there's a lot of people with a false security. That means the devil has already fooled millions of people. Every day he's pulled the wool over their eyes and they have marched into hell, lulling themselves into a false sense of security while they burn in the fires here and ultimately in the eternal fires. Paul warned us in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 3. It says, while people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as, a, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. There's no hope. There's, this, this is the storyline of the world. We are surrounded by people who think they're all right. 
We are surrounded by friends who know that you are a Christian, but they think they're Christian too. We have parents and children who follow the denominational world and they have fallen asleep in a peace that the devil offers them but will never bring. Hell is real. Now, I say all this not because I'm trying to scare you out of hell. Although, by all means, if you're not a child of God, may it scare you out of hell. I say this to the Christians here. Because if hell is real, then that means that, that hell is full of people. People you know and people you love. And there's a whole lot of people right now that are marching that direction. And I tell you that hell is real so we can stop that. This is the power that God gives us. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. This is the power that God has put in my hands, in your hands as Christians. And what he wants us to do is to take this book, this message, and to arrest that steady stream that is going into hell. Think of it this way. All of those who are already burning in the fires that Jude is saying, snatch them out of the fires right now. Those are people that we, we can make a dent in the population of hell with. Hell doesn't have to have all the people it's going to get. And we have an opportunity, we have a power to make a dent, to, make a, 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 to change the population of hell. If we believe what the Bible has just told us about hell, then we, we, we've got to understand people we know and love are going to go there, but we have this opportunity to stop it. There is a spiritual carnage that is happening all around us, and we are seeing it. And if we will put on those God glasses that Jude gives to us, if we'll put on the God glasses that the Bible gives to us, we will see that spiritual carnage. And while we may look at that and we say, you know, that's just, that's just a lot of people. I mean, if I had my way, I would, I would go to hell right now and shut the gates and not let another person go. But I can't shut the gates of hell. That, that's not what God has given me to do. If I had my way, I would go and extinguish the fires of hell so that they didn't burn, but but God has not given to me the opportunity or ability to extinguish the fires. What God said is from right here on earth, save people. We look at that and say, that's too many people. He didn't say save the whole. He said save a soul. We, we had the privilege here at West Hill of witnessing several of our young men just recently, in the last month or so. Two or three of them have obeyed the gospel. I love these young men, but let me tell you something about it. The moment before they stepped into the baptism, they were standing in the fire. They were going to hell. Mom and Dad, you may not like me saying that about your sons. They were going to hell. I was the same way. There was a moment that I was standing in the fire and I stepped out of the fire and into the waters of baptism and I was saved. Had I never made that step, I would burn in hell. And every one of us that are Christians are the same way. We were going to hell because hell is real. And God says, now take this word and go change lives. Go make a dent in the population of hell. Don't try to extinguish the fire. Let's just divert its reserve of people. Let's get them to go the other way. Don't ignore it. Expose it for what it is. Let's quit playing peekaboo with hell. Because what's going to happen is the devil's going to win. But instead of playing peekaboo, let's aggressively change our actions and our attitude toward those who are going there. You know who they are. I'm not telling you to be judgmental. I'm not telling you to be holier than anyone. I'm just telling you to be compassionate and merciful to those who are being lost. It doesn't make you a better person. It makes you a Christian. 
And maybe, together, we can use our power to spark a revolution in people who are living for hell right now. And maybe the first soul that you saved today was yours. Maybe you're on the outside of Christ now. You've not thought too much about hell. You've not thought too much about where you're going. I think a lot of people, it's not that they've looked at the evidence and looked at the outcomes and said, well, you know, I think I'll choose hell. For most people, they just don't think about it. This morning, I say, let's think about it. And as you're thinking, you're saying, I'm, I'm not ready, Sam. I know there's some of you here that are not ready. I want you to know I don't look down upon you. I plead with you to make a change right now. Some of you are thinking, yeah, there's some young folks here in this auditorium that are that way. I'm not thinking of the young folks, though. I'm thinking of those of you who are married to a Christian and you've never yet obeyed the gospel. I'm thinking of those who are thinking, well, I've, I've been doing good though this far in my life. I, I don't need anything more. And let me tell you, you do. Because right now you're standing in the flame. And you can try to ignore it. You can pretend they're not there. But until you make the step into that water, you're in danger. And this morning, if you're ready to make that step, if you're ready to, if you're ready to make that change in your life and be baptized for the remission of your sins, putting aside the false sense of security, putting aside the pride, putting aside the, the trust in man-made denominations and embracing the truth as you've known it and you've heard it preached many times, now is that opportunity. Won't you come? Won't you come while we sing this song? So I'll be